This is Radio 314 on the Red Ice Radio Network. Hello and welcome. This is Lana Lochtef. Thanks for listening. My guest today is Robert Guffey, the author of the nonfiction book, Cryptoscatology, Conspiracy Theory as Art Form. He's published numerous short stories, articles, and interviews in a wide range of magazines and anthologies. He's currently a lecturer in the Department of English at California State University, Long Beach. At the start of this interview, Robert tells us how he became a Freemason and what led him into the field of conspiracy theory. He'll explain why he compares the field of conspiracy theory to classical mythology. We also talk about how the field of conspiracy theory research is littered with the carcasses of sincere truth seekers who failed in their search. Then we'll get into the conspiratorial side of the educational system, political correctness, and the war on the imagination. Later, Robert talks about intelligence agents involved in the sci-fi genre. And he also shares a story on the phenomena known as gang stalking. So don't go anywhere. Welcome, Robert Guffey. How are you today? I'm fine. Well, of course, I have to start with this question. As you are a 32nd degree Scottish Rite Freemason, what drew you into conspiracy theories? Uh, that is an interesting question. Uh, it probably goes back to uh, in the article that you read, The War Against the Imagination, which is up on uh, John Rappaport's uh, blog. Um, that's all about education. And I mentioned in there that one day we had a visitor, a substitute teacher in middle school. Uh, the regular teacher was sick or had fallen into a manhole or got hit by a meteorite or something. I don't know what happened to them. But for one day, the substitute teacher came in and uh, just started going off on a tirade. He was rather young, I remember. He was probably like in his early 20s or something. And he wanders in and, and he says, you know the stories that you've heard that uh, George Washington, you know, cut down a cherry tree and promised never to tell a lie? That's that's bull. <laughs> that never happened. Uh, you know, all this stuff that you've been told, it's all bull. And everyone kind of looked around at each other like, what? what is this? You know, the sort of hurricane suddenly came into the room. And uh, he, actually, he actually recommended that we read Robert Anton Wilson, uh, which I'm sure everyone else in the room Sure. Probably ignored him, um, uh, but uh, I actually read Robert Anton Wilson and and uh, the Illuminoids, which had an introduction by Robert Anton Wilson early on, and uh, I didn't immediately start looking into conspiracies at that moment. It's just that that guy sort of planted the seeds in my head, and then much later on, when I was in high school. And when you're in high school, you suddenly realize that you're sort of like a rat in a cage. In fact, I remember in high school, I came up with the, the notion that, uh, that all of high school and the entire public education system was a vast uh, conspiracy to help me out. <laughs> it was this experiment to see which people would notice that they were inside an experiment. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and those people who noticed it and realized it would... would see the truth and benefit from it. And so I thought that was interesting because a lot of people who critique conspiracy theories, they claim that um, it's just a method of feeling comfortable in the universe, that if you feel you're being persecuted, that way you have a convenient uh, excuse as to why you're a failure in life. You can say, oh, it's because of the Freemasons yeah. or it's the Bilderbergers, right? But I wondered what sort of psychological... Uh, theory would explain me coming up with a with, with with the rather bizarre notion that I was the subject of a benign conspiracy, that, that the entire system was conspiring to help me out. Um, <laughs> that's not that's not a normal psychological problem. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, when, when so when I came upon that theory, uh, then I just started reading. I started reading John Rappaport, AIDS Inc early on in high school, um, Dr. Alan Cantwell, AIDS and the Doctors of Death. Um, let's see what else? Assassination of Robert Kennedy, which is an early, extremely good book. Um, that's a good, that's a good gateway drug. You know, marijuana is supposedly a gateway drug. Mm -hmm. Eventually you end up doing meth and heroin. Uh, the uh, assassination of Robert Kennedy, uh, by Christian and Turner, John Christian and William Turner, that book, that's a good gateway drug. If you if you read that book, eventually you'll be you know uh, living you know homeless, uh, just doing nothing but reading <laughs> conspiracy magazines. Yep. 
So, so uh, I started questioning things early on just because I just seemed to notice uh, the way the system was rigged. Um, so yeah, I had, I had a lot, I got kicked out of almost every single English class I had in high school uh, because of the essays I was writing. And I, w I was attempting to um, simply entertain the, the English teachers, but they weren't entertained. And I eventually got kicked out of Torrance High where they filmed the Beverly Hills 90210 and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I got kicked out of that school. I had to go to a continuation school called Sherry in Torrance, uh, which was where all the uh, gangbangers and uh, pregnant girls went Great. and me. And so I got kicked out of the high school and went to the uh, correctional school. And just by observing the way the system was run, uh, that uh, if you told the truth, you got punished. Uh, I began to see the validity of conspiracy theories on a wider scale. Well, I like this line from your book. Conspiracy theory is littered with the carcasses of sincere truth seekers who failed in their search. Can you talk about this? <laughs> well, uh, in the, uh, the Illuminoids, a book by Neil Wilgus, N-E-A-L, his last name is W-I-L-G-U-S, it has a wonderful introduction by Robert Anton Wilson, which I quote in the introduction of my book. And he talks about this concept, this esoteric concept of Chapel Perilous. And Chapel Perilous is this sort of mystical place where you have to enter into it with the wand of intuition and the wand of rationality at the same time. And if you're lacking one or the other, you will get lost in this limbo world of Chapel Perilous. Uh, so... The problem is that some people go into conspiracies with one or the other. They're either too rational or too intuitive, and they don't balance it out, and they get lost. Um, I've, I've met a lot of conspiracy theorists who don't have a sense of humor, for example. Oh, yeah. Same with And ones. they become very, very serious, uh, terminally so. And so if you can't have a, sort of a balanced perspective on things, if you get too serious, you believe everything you hear, uh, you end up as a, a littered carcass <laughs> uh, uh, lying on the sidewalk somewhere. Yeah, I'd agree that the constant references to the Freemasons and the Illuminati can be very tiring. It's the Illuminati, man. It's like, okay, so what are you doing about it, even if that's the case? You know what I mean? Well, you know, I, so I, I've, met, uh, I've heard interviews where they'll say, this is a, an expert on the Illuminati. And I think, how is that possible? How can you have an expert on the Illuminati? Are they members of the Illuminati? Have they met someone who's in the Illuminati? No, but somehow they're experts on it. And, and uh, it seemed to me when uh, I started reading all these conspiracy journals, particularly in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, those various conspiracy magazines out there like Steam Shovel Press and uh, Splatland and uh, Paranoia, which I wrote for quite a bit, um, there was a lot of you know, anti-Masonic stuff. And I thought... Have any of these people ever actually gone and talked to a Freemason? Have they ever gone and tried to join? Uh, well, why, you know, why not? How about get up off your ass and actually go and like look into it? Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. And I, all I did was just walk down the street from my house to the Blue Lodge. That was in Torrance. Uh, Lodge 394. University Lodge 394. And I walked in. And uh, at the time, I was a graduate student at CSU Long Beach and I asked to see the uh, master of the lodge and I met with him and I told him I was interested in joining and he asked why and I said well uh, I was a, liter a literature student a uh, creative writing literature student and I noticed that there was a lot of Masonic symbolism in uh, 19th century literature uh, that I was interested in, or even going back even further to Shakespeare, um, uh, you know, Faust and um, oh, H. Ryder Haggard and Edgar Rice Burroughs and all these uh, writers I was interested in in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, a lot of it had esoteric Masonic symbolism in it. And I told him I was a literature student and I was interested in studying masonry further so I could understand the symbolism further when I wrote about it. Uh, and I asked him if that was a valid reason for joining. And he said, he said, I've never heard of that being a reason for joining, but it sounds valid to me. Uh, and I was surprised that when we started talking about Freemasonry, 
I actually knew more about it than he did. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was the master of the lodge. I mean, I started, I started talking. He knew who Albert Pike was, of course. Uh, but I started mentioning other people, uh, other writers, uh, C.W. Leadbeater and Manly P. Hall and, and people like that. And he didn't even know who they were. Uh, and, and in fact, that's the case with <laughs> uh, many of the Masons who, who you meet. They're very sincere uh, people. They're very dedicated to the rituals and, and et cetera. But in terms of the esoteric nature of it, uh, very few of them know or care anything about that. Yeah, I've noticed that. So uh, it's very interesting that they're supposedly running the world, but they, meanwhile they don't know anything about Freemasonry pretty much. Because <laughs> they're eating uh, babies all day. Uh, well, <laughs> well, exactly. I, I uh, uh, it's there. There are some lodges where the members are interested in esoteric stuff. Uh, the Fauché Lodge in Culver City, for example, has a lot of uh, very learned sort of academic types there. Uh, and um, there's the Scottish Rite Research Society, which publishes a journal called Heredom. H-E-R-E-D-O-M, uh, and, and they publish a lot of very interesting articles in there about the history, the esoteric history of Freemasonry. And in that book, in Herodom, I can't remember which volume it was, there was an article by, uh, I believe, Jay Kinney, uh, who, he wrote an article called, Is Freemasonry Afraid of Its Own Shadow? I actually recommend that article to anyone who's concerned about the Masonic conspiracy, because that, the entire, that's, that's one of the best articles I've ever read about Freemasonry. Because the point of that article is that a lot of Masons don't know or don't care about the esoteric roots of mm -hmm. Freemasonry. And meanwhile, a lot of Masons who are very old uh, at this point, I mean, I'm, I'm uh, 42, uh, and I'm, very, I'm like a baby compared to most of the people who are in Freemasonry. And a lot of them want to know how to recruit younger people into it, or not recruit it, because you're not supposed to actively go out and recruit, but just how to attract members, because quite frankly, it's dying out. I mean, they don't have enough people to, to perform the rituals. And, uh, uh, and Jay Kinney's answer is, well, what interests young people today is the esoteric roots of it, but that's the aspect that everyone's turned their backs on in Freemasonry, and mainly uh, the title is Freemasonry a Fear of Its Own Shadow, uh, references the fact that uh, when Captain Morgan was assassinated and, and killed, it had this, there, was a, uh, um, um, there was this backlash against Freemasonry. And so at that point, Masons tried to bury their esoteric past so as people wouldn't think they were saint worshippers, etc. Mm -hmm. And so they became more interested in, more in, in volunteering and showing everybody that they weren't devil worshippers. And there, there's this sort of lingering subconscious fear of the esoteric roots of it. Uh, uh, in other words, if they actually delve into that, but people will think that they're Satan worshippers or something. Uh, and so a lot of Masons don't know about that esoteric background because they're kind of afraid to even look at it. And so Jay Kinney suggests that if Masons want younger people to, to join, they should exploit that, um, the esoteric background uh, of, of Masonry, the hermetic, uh, alchemical uh, background of Freemasonry. Uh, and if they did that, they probably would uh, attract younger people. I, I have seen, I have come across uh, younger people, by which I mean maybe people in their late 20s, early 30s, who have read things like The Da Vinci Code, uh, uh, and 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 I have actually gotten interested in Freemasonry because of that popular uh, fiction interpretation of of Freemasonry or or the uh, National Treasure movies. So in their lodge, do they ever discuss, "Hey, we formed America," because <laughs> there's Masonic <laughs> symbolism found everywhere in American oh, society, there's, right? Uh, there's a sort of um, they know enough to to say that. <laughs> you know, they they know enough that they they understand that. Uh, uh, a lot of the founding fathers were Freemasons, uh, but it doesn't really extend beyond that. You know, um, they 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 don't know too much about, um, say, the stuff that Manly P. Hall writes about in the Secret Destiny of America. They don't really know anything about that. Well, it seems conspiracy is starting to go mainstream, but only the politically correct topics that can help control the current political and social narrative. For instance, the Jewish-owned Rolling Stone magazine published an article that said, 
Conspiracy theorists of the world, believers in the hidden hands of the Rothschilds and the Masons and the Illuminati, we skeptics owe you an apology. You were right. So what do you think of that? <laughs> well, okay. Well, uh, I haven't read that article. Are, are they being... Uh, there seems to be a, a tone of uh, sarcasm there. What, what, it's probably what in my voice, but yeah, they were saying that the players may be a little different, but the basic premise is correct. And then, of course, the mainstream answer is always more government control. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. Whenever there's a, a shooter at Fort Hood or if there's a, 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 an active uh, shooter at a high school somewhere, uh, the, you know, the, 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 or if the uh, Oklahoma Federal Building blows up, um, uh, no one ever takes um, responsibility for that. The answer is go to Congress and ask for more yeah, money. Exactly. Uh, so that that's uh, and is that what they say in the article? We, well, we need well in a roundabout way. Yeah, we need more government controls. You know, let's so let's socialize everything, people. That'll make it better. And and that'll prevent the conspiracies. Yeah, I guess so. That's, <laughs> some people really believe that, though. Even in the conspiracy field, you wouldn't believe how many socialists there are. They think that, you know, they're blame capitalism for everything, but socialism is the innocent saint, you know? Oh, well, you know, hey, hey I, I teach on a, a campus, so I know that. Uh, you know, I, I teach at CSU Long Beach, and um, the university system is the only place uh, I've ever seen where uh, people still sort of seriously uphold Marxism as a valid um, uh, alternative yep. to what's going on now, you know, as if somehow that's better. Uh, you know, more authoritarian social control will uh, will solve all these problems. Uh, but I, I certainly do uh, see that a lot uh, at the, where where I work. Of course, uh, yeah. You know, I mean, I mean, the the right wingers who say that there's a conspiracy of uh, communists and socialists in the uh, uh, American university system is not necessarily they're not necessarily wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, but though it's it's a more of a um, free floating. Uh, conspiracy. Uh, it's it's uh, like-minded people tend to gather together. Uh, I, I don't see it as being a sort of the communist uh, uh, headquarters is directing that um, a bunch of socialists. You know, you should go teach at this campus. You should go teach at this campus over there. It's just that like-minded people tend to flock together, and so you end up with a bunch of people who uh, believe in socialism teaching at, at the university. And of course, then they try to prevent anyone who has an alternate point of view from, from joining the, the club, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And their tactics might be a little more Fabian too. So they believe in gradualism. Yes. Through evolution, yes. not revolution. Right. Right. Yes, absolutely. The hundred year plan. So <laughs> our, our culture right now, is just infested with what is politically correct. It just drives me nuts. I even see it in alt media. There's certain topics, you know, conspiracy theories. Oh, that's off limits, you know, because you're going to piss people off for saying that or someone's going to get offended or you're going to be racist. So this PC programming runs so deep in Western society. And to me, this is a conspiracy. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. Uh, I mean, uh, in the sense that there definitely is a conspiracy to... Well, it's sort of a symptom of a larger problem, isn't it? Uh, the larger problem is the war against the imagination. Uh, and uh, we live in, in a time when uh, even comedians who are known for their outrageousness uh, are not allowed to be funny. Uh, if they go on Twitter and tweet out some one-liner, uh, uh, immediately uh, they're threatened with, uh, well, we're going to pull your series off ABC or uh, we're going to pull your advertising uh, because you said that. If you're a comedian and you're scared of what to say and what not to say, that's a problem. <laughs> okay. you, you, we've now reached some, we crossed some sort of Rubicon. I mean, comedians used to be, they were the one people, they, they were the, the one person who, who could get away with saying anything, right? You go on a stage with a microphone. As long as you have the microphone, you can get away with saying anything that normally you would get punched in the face for saying if you were off stage, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and and now uh, there are even comedians who live in fear. Uh, 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 they don't know uh, what to do. Um, and uh, I mean, I, when JFK was killed, Lenny Bruce went on stage and did a whole routine about it that night. Uh, uh, I, I can't even imagine that happening now. Uh, so. I think that that, that that political correctness, which I've certainly bumped up against as far back as um, 
high school, uh, I, I was, it was early on that I realized that uh, even though I was um, sort of more in high school, sort of more left-leaning, uh, I, I noticed that the only times I ever got censored was from liberals. <laughs> yep. The, the, you know, supposedly the people who were sort of against the Reagan administration, who, you know, I, I grew up under the mushroom-shaped shadow. With all their the, tolerance, you know. All their tolerance. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I came up with a term for it back in high school. I called them green shirts. Uh, instead of brown shirts, they were green shirts. You know, they were like loving, caring, environmentally friendly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you said anything that went against their sort of 60s-based the dogma uh, of love and caring, you know, you, 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 know, you will believe in peace, peace and loving or we'll kill you. Uh, kind of uh, rhetoric. Uh, I bumped up against that really early on and realized, saw that for what it was. Uh, and it's just gotten worse uh, over the years to the extent that basically if you don't agree with the way that they think uh, the world should be run with their, their, their idea of what a utopia is, um, you, you know, we're, we're going to bulldoze right over you, pal. Uh, and they don't think of that as censorship. They don't think of that as authoritarian. They don't look in the mirror and see any relation between what they're doing and past authoritarian societies. Uh, why, uh, why that is is that it's a symptom of the war against the imagination. If you keep, if you keep uh, oppressing people and, and letting them know that you better not even think this, pal, that, that's the goal of political correctness, right? Mm-hmm. It's, uh, you better not even think this. Uh, uh, it's part of that hundred-year plan uh, of gradualism. Uh, that 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 is that is a dampening of the imagination to the extent where now, which I write about in the article, the, the war against the imagination article. Uh, you know, uh, the the campus where I teach, uh, where we've been told that we can't use fiction in our the English composition classes. That's insane. Uh, which is insane. Uh, I mean, we've been told you can't use 1984. But Das Kapital, yeah. you know, that's a mandatory reading. <laughs> oh, absolutely. That would be fine. If I assigned that in the English 100 class, that would be absolutely fine. <laughs> no, one, no one would complain about that. At least no one in the faculty would complain about that. Mm. Uh, but if I assign 1984, I, I've been told that if we find that you're assigning these novels, like 1984, you find out about it, you're, you're, you're out of here, buddy. Uh, and uh, 1984, Brave New World, Fahrenheit 451, any of these books, they, we can't use those. <laughs> Why is that? What is it about fiction? And by the way, that's not just um, at the university system. It's, there's something called Common Core. I was going to ask you about that uh, later, yeah. Uh, Common Core is essentially you know, the Obama administration of No Child Left Behind. And uh, it states that in, you should have 30% uh, fiction, 70% nonfiction uh, when we start out from K through 12. And then as you go up the, the, the grades, eventually you will have uh, no fiction whatsoever. And you just have to ask yourself, why is that? Exactly. The, the architect of Common Core, whose name happily escapes me at the moment, um, uh, has stated that it's because, well, you don't get anything useful out of fiction, you know. That doesn't teach you how to write a resume. It David Coleman, you. sorry. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. I, I had blocked it out of my mind on purpose. <laughs> Uh, uh, these things don't help you write a resume, etc. Um, is that the reason? I think really the reason is much larger. I, I say in the in the the article that if you're not familiar with fiction, you're going to have a hard time trying to discern what is fiction when it comes tumbling out of the mouth of a duplicitous president or a duplicitous teacher or a duplicitous police officer. In other words, if you're not familiar with fiction, that's the basic tool of being able to understand if someone is lying to you. (laughs) So if you have no experience with fiction, then you're not going to be able to see fiction for what it is when it's right in front of your face. Also, fiction is far more dangerous than nonfiction and always has been because, as any researcher uh, knows, there are some things that you know for certain, but that you can't prove. And so you're not going to write an article about it because you can't prove it. So what do you do instead? You write a piece of fiction. Yeah. You embed the truth in fiction in such a way that, um, I mean, science fiction writers have done this for, for decades. Uh, you, you, you create a fiction that enables you to tell the truth in a way that you won't get thrown in jail or killed. Right? Uh, I mean, Shakespeare 
this goes back to ha Hamlet in, in, in Hamlet, which was written in 1600. Uh, in, in Hamlet, you have the in the middle of the, the play, you have the murder of Gonzago, where uh, Hamlet knows that his uncle uh, killed his father, but he has no way to prove it. So what does he do? He creates a, a play within the play of Hamlet called The Murder of Gonzago that is performed in front of uh, his uncle. And, and so his uncle sees uh, the reality of what occurred played out in front of him in the form of fiction, and he freaks out. And, and so Hamlet is able to prove uh, in front of everyone uh, that uh, his uncle is the murderer because he creates this fiction and basically throws the, the, the reality back in his face, uh, creates a, a mirror out of fiction. Shakespeare was commenting on this back then, in 1600, the danger, uh, how dangerous fiction is. And so if you remove that, uh, you're taking away a, a, an important tool uh, for telling people the truth. Um, I mean, the science fiction writers, Kurt Siodmak, uh, he was a science fiction writer, wrote a book called Donovan's Brain back in 1940, which is all about um, controlling people from afar, uh, mind control, uh, turning people into sort of robot assassins. Uh, that's, that's what that book is really about in science fiction terms. And uh, Siodmak was a member of the OSS and later the, the CIA. Uh, and he wrote a lot of films, science fiction films, like uh, Earth vs. the Flying Saucers and uh, Creature with the Atom Brain, which came out in 1955. If you watch that movie, Creature with the Atom Brain, it's on one level a B science fiction film. And yet on the other hand, he's also revealing genuine information about uh, people like Jose Delgado, who was a scientist who was involved in early mind control research in Madrid. Uh, he actually, Kurt Siodmak mentions him in the middle of the movie. In the middle of the film, there's a little like murder of Gonzago moment where he has the, the main character uh, show this little film that explains the intricacies of, of, of the brain control research that was new at that time, not many people knew about, it, and yet he embeds it in the middle of the film. Uh, so fiction serves that purpose of uh, being able to reveal the truth in such a way where, as I said, you don't get killed or thrown in jail. So you have to really wonder why they're trying to eliminate fiction across the board. Um, to me, I think that's the reason, because it's, it's so dangerous. I have a second book coming out called Spies and Saucers. It's coming out from PS Publishing in England later this year. Uh, it's, a, it's a collection of uh, three novellas set in the 1950s. Uh, it's not, it's not nonfiction, it's fiction. Uh, and again, it's sort of... Um, there are things that I know or suspect that I couldn't write about in nonfiction terms, so I, I created these three novellas that are all linked together, uh, and uh, it's very much about um, uh, how how propaganda is created and and the type of people they hire to create propaganda, and and so I decided to explore that in a fictional format because I can't do it non in nonfiction, so. So I, I, I'm not just talking theoretically. I, I know that this process occurs because I'm, I'm engaged in it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, in your book you mention a lot about uh, intelligence agents that are, have been involved in the sci-fi genre. So it makes me think, is this maybe a, a psyops to make people paranoid? Or are they just really trying to tell you truths that the government is doing? Oh, well, both. I mean, that, that's the thing. It's, 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 if something is a tool... Um, it can be used, you know, a knife can be used to kill someone. It can be used to carve a turkey, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so the, particularly in terms of the science fiction medium or, or let's say, fantasy or horror, that, those sort of genres, uh, it can be used to reveal the truth, and it could also be used as a means of social control. Uh, I mean, if you remember in the, in the 1980s, the main message from the Reagan White House was that sex equals death. This was the AIDS era, right? I mean, they basically came out and said that. Sex equals death. So at that time, you also had a slew of horror films. The most, the, these are the most popular films. They were slasher films where the, the, the girl who, who had sex first was, would always be killed by the, the, the madman with the axe. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, the, so the, these, these things, these fictions, can be used as a means of social control to cause paranoia like what you just said. And in that chapter, which is chapter five of Cryptoscatology, which is called Science Fiction as Manipulation, 
I use examples of, of, of people, science fiction writers, who use the medium for that purpose, uh, a sort of negative propaganda. Uh, but then there are those other writers who use it for means of liberation. And I would think of, for example, Phil Dick. Well, I recently spoke to um, uh, Phil Dick's wife, uh, uh, Tessa Dick, his widow. Uh, she, she has a radio show. And, and, and to my surprise, she had read the book. And in Chapter 5, I talk about Phil Dick, and I make speculations. It's not really something I can prove, but uh, I, I, it always seemed to me that Phil Dick was maybe a victim of uh, mind control. Uh, there seems to be signs of it if you read his book, Valis, for example. I think that he was a, a target, a targeted individual, uh, perhaps because of the things he was saying that were so dangerous in his novels. Uh, and uh, I was surprised when uh, I, I was contacted by Tessa Dick, and, and she said, I absolutely believe that you're right. In fact, she said that your chapter illuminated me on, on what occurred to us back then. Uh, that, that was surprising to me. Um, uh, and in fact, she, she uh, the, you, in fact, if you, if you just go to, uh, she has a, it was a radio show called uh, Ancient of Days is the name of her radio show. And, and you can hear the, the conversation between the two of us, because she says really incredible things that sort of underscore or, or actually uh, back up uh, what was really sort of idle speculation in, in the book, uh, it, sh uh, it turned out that I was closer to the truth than, than even I knew. Uh, so Phil Dick would be an example of a science fiction writer who used the, the medium to wake people up. Now, you've said, too, in an article that you've used Brave New World in your classes with undeniable success in the past. So how do students respond to a book like that? Well, uh, with uh, Brave New World or 1984 or, say, Fahrenheit 451, they recognize, they know what this is all about. I mean, at a, at a subconscious level, they know what this is all about. I, this semester, since I've had my arm tied uh, uh, in terms of uh, not being able to use fiction, uh, I've been assigning articles by John Taylor Gatto. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah, we know him. G A T T O. Uh, he wrote a book called "Dumbing Us Down" and "Underground History of Education." Brilliant man. Um, uh, New York State Teacher of the Year in the 1990s. He got fired because he was actually teaching people, and <clears throat> you're not supposed to do that. Yep. And and so uh, uh, he wrote this book, "Dumbing Us Down," and he has a um, a speech that he he made uh, upon receiving the New York State Teacher of the Year award uh, called "The Seven Lessons of School Teacher." which is a wonderful, wonderful article that encapsulates this entire process of what it's like you know, trying to teach um, in the public education system. Uh, and so I assigned that article, and man, the students, they, it's, a, it's an eye-opener for them because he, he, he labels and identifies a process that has been going on to them, that is being done to them since kindergarten on all the way to 12th grade, and now they're in, they're in college, and generally when I get to them, they're, they're freshmen. And so they've had 12 years of this, and either they've never questioned it, they've never thought about it, or they have questioned it, but maybe thought that there was something wrong with them. And then suddenly they see this, they, they read the words of this teacher who was you know, given awards for teaching, basically encapsulating or, or codifying uh, giving their suspicions uh, uh, genuine um, uh, historical facts and background to to back up what, what they what they only suspected subconsciously before, and so it's a real eye opener for them reading reading Gatto, uh, and and similarly uh, reading uh, 1984, Brave New World, Fahrenheit 451. Um, it's, it's Kurt Vonnegut, uh, a short story called Harrison Bergeron, which you've, if you've never read it, is the ultimate manifesto or statement on a politically correct culture, because Harrison Bergeron is a very short story. It's only about, let's say, eight pages, maybe. But it's brilliant. Uh, he wrote it back in the, I think, the late 50s. Uh, and uh, it's all, it's a world, a futuristic society where everyone must be equal. Uh, and, for example, one of the characters is a great mathematician. So whenever he starts thinking about mathematical equations, these bells go off in his head, so he, <laughs> he can't think. And his daughter is a brilliant ballerina, and they, they wrap these like metal 
uh, bracelets around her legs so that she can't dance oh. quite as well as she could if she didn't have them on. Yeah, pretty soon it'll uh, be all, you're too pretty. We're going to give you plastic surgery to make you ugly so you can be like everyone else, you know? So you can be like everyone else. Everyone has to be equal. Uh, and, and, and it's a brilliant story. And when I have them write about that story, um, they all immediately recognize what it's about and they see it immediately as an allegory of not just the time period that Vonnegut wrote it, but even more so of an allegory of now. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, they they all recognize what what the story is about. So they respond well to it. They respond well to fiction. I've used Phil Dick's books, uh, Scanner Darkly, uh, for example, which is set in Orange County, Southern California in in the near future. And it is a sort of a dystopian novel about uh, this guy who's a narc. Um, you know, he works for the police department, but he's infiltrated these local, um, uh, you know, dr- drug users to try to bust them. And he starts taking this drug called Substance D, which uh, basically splits your brain into two. And so uh, he begins to forget that he is a narcotics officer, and he starts narking on himself. Uh, and uh, the entire book is basically about surveillance culture and the inability to recognize yourself. And, and, uh, and because of the local color, because it's, it's set here in Southern California, the students respond to it and, uh, very well. But um, I, I, I haven't used it for several semesters because I, I've been told I can. <laughs> God. I, I, in fact, uh, the, this, this, the, we were told this uh, out of the blue on, uh, it was April 20th, uh, 2012. It was Hitler's birthday, which I thought was very appropriate. Oh, yeah, definitely. Well, these liberals are fascists. They're always accusing, you know, Hitler and all these right-wingers, but they're doing the same thing, you know? Jeez. Abs- well, a- a- absolutely. Um, uh, and and, and uh, let's face it, Hitler was a new ager, you know? He was a vegetarian who, who, who loved animals. So what is their fear of the imagination? Why can't you use words like wonder, enthusiasm, and imagination in the classroom? Um, I I think that if you, uh, at least on the high school level, I know that, uh, well, I think because uh, if if you start thinking too much for yourself, Uh, we're, we're talking about a culture where everything is becoming increasingly clamped down to the extent that uh, I know John Rappaport, for example, has been doing a series of articles about, about um, Snowden, and he's the only one who's talking about this aspect of it, that he thinks the main point of the Snowden story is simply that everyone should keep, is, they want everyone to keep writing about how we're being surveilled so that everyone's paranoid and fearful that indeed everything that they're saying or writing is in fact recorded somewhere, and therefore we should be afraid and, and just toe the line because we know that, that we're being surveilled. We know that because of the, of the Snowden uh, revelations. <laughs> in other words, that, that, that's the real purpose of the Snowden story, is just to get the story out and everyone can be paranoid about it. And so in terms of wonder, enthusiasm, creativity, uh, these are things that are not allowed if you're constantly fearful and, and paranoid. Uh, uh, there's a phenomenon now, which has been, actually been going on for many years, uh, called gang stalking. Are you familiar no. with it? Uh, gang stalking is a term. It was originally called something else, and it sort of evolved into being called gang stalking. Basically... Gang stalking is where you'll be chosen either at random or for because you did something to piss someone off. Uh, they, and when I say they, I, I, I'll be more specific about that later on. Uh, they'll send out people, all sorts of different people, to surveil you, follow you around, uh, basically uh, to gaslight you uh, and to uh, drive you slowly crazy. Uh, they they target one particular person, and dozens and dozens and dozens of people will be assigned to follow you around and drive you nuts. Uh, and and this is going on. You'd be amazed at how many people this is being done to Whoa. on a daily basis. And I I know this for a fact because I have a friend 
Uh, his name's Damien. I wrote an article about this in 40 and Times, issue 305, in the September issue um, last year. Um, it, the article is called Strange Tales of Homeland Security. And I've gotten a lot of feedback on the article. The article is about a friend of mine. And, and in the article, I called him Dion, but he told me he didn't mind if I used his real name. His real name's Damien. I've known him since I was 16. And in, um, right after 9-11, let's say about two years after 9-11, it was 2003, the summer of 2003, that this, this all started for my friend. Uh, Damien was living in the Pacific Beach area of San Diego, and he was involved in drugs, and his house was sort of a, a party house. And so other people were coming in and out of his house all the time. Well, one guy who came in was this kid, this kid named Lee, who had gone AWOL from Camp Pendleton, which is a Marine base that's there in San Diego. Mm -hmm. He had gone AWOL, he had stolen uh, 26 pairs of high-tech night vision goggles, a 9mm uh, gun taken off the body of a dead Iraqi general, uh, a DOD laptop computer, and a truck. He stole all of these things from the base. I don't know how <laughs> he managed to take all of these things in, in the post-9-11 lockdown, but he did. Where does he go? He ends up at Damien's house. Damien doesn't know this guy. A lot of people are coming in and out because, as I said, it was a party house in Pacific Beach. This kid, Lee, stays at his house for about three nights, uh, bringing with him some of these items. And one night, he opens up the laptop computer, and the DOD symbol sort of appears on the screen. And my friend Damien says, whoa, what, the, what is that? Uh, you got to get this stuff out of here. You know, get, get out of here. <laughs> he, he throws him out of the house, but Lee won't go. And he says, no, 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 no. It's okay. They can't find me. Well, within, within about two minutes, there's a knock at the door. Uh, a woman from NCIS is there. This is before the series, the TV series came on the air. NCIS, they're, they're knocking at the door. And uh, they, they demand to search the place. Uh, Damien tells them to come back with a warrant. Well, they do that within about 10 minutes. Uh, they arrest Damien for selling stolen equipment to Al-Qaeda, <laughs> <laughs> even though he had absolutely nothing to do with any of this. And the guy was just sleeping on his floor, you know, for a couple of nights. Damien gets thrown in jail in San Diego for a week. And they're interrogating him. Who is this guy? How did you meet this guy? What was your role in this? Uh, you know, on and on. Who is your contact? Damien's saying, I don't know anything about any of this. He, the kid was just sleeping on my floor, you know. And they don't believe that. They keep interrogating him. They, they're asking him to finger the guy. And, and, and Damien's like an old, he's been in and out of jail, so he knows he doesn't want to be a snitch, right? So he, doesn't, he refuses to cooperate. After about a week, they let him go. And he thinks, oh, good. Whew. They realized that I had nothing to do with this. Well, within a couple of days of being allowed to leave, he notices that these people are following him around everywhere. He goes into a 7-Eleven on Garnet Avenue, Pacific, uh, Pacific Beach, and, and about seven jarhead-looking guys, these military-looking dudes, like follow him in. And then he'll leave. They'll follow him out, out again. They're parked outside his house. 24 hours a day. At first, I thought maybe he's suffering from meth-induced paranoia. Perhaps that's what's going on. No, it became obvious that that's not what was going on. He, I asked him to take photographs of the license plates of the cars that were following him around. Well, he does that. He sends me dozens of them. I have a friend who works at the DMV in uh, Seattle, uh, and uh, he ran the plate numbers. Not one of them officially existed. Uh, that, what that means is that, because uh, I, I knew that they existed, I saw the photographs. It, it, if it's not in the DMV, that means it's a government vehicle. Uh, uh, so I knew at that point that he wasn't suffering from paranoia. This, this behavior amps up and goes on. Meanwhile, the woman who had arrested him from the NCIS is constantly in contact with him. She'll call him up on the phone, show up at his doorstep. Have you changed your mind? Do you have any information you want to share with us about this equipment? You know, they, they, they needed to find these night vision goggles. That was the main thing they were concerned about. And uh, they, they weren't all there at the house, apparently. And they, they, for some reason, thought that Damien knew where they were. 
and 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 Damien could tell him, I don't know where they are. Uh, and he would ask them, are you following me? And then she would reply, oh, no, we're not following you. And then she'd leave. And then 12 guys would show up outside and just park outside the house. Well, it, it amped up to the point where they were following him everywhere. They, they were um, bombarding him with electromagnetic energy mm-hmm. and uh, uh, b- bizarre um, technology. It's amazing uh, they spent all these resources for this one person, too. Exactly. Well, I think what was going on is, uh, first of all, it could happen to anyone. In this particular case, we know why it happened because he pissed them off, right? And they thought that he had the stuff. But you know, if you're if you're driving around on the freeway and you cut off one of these people who's in the NCIS or and they piss you off, now you're on the list, uh, and now now you're getting followed. And and as you say. Uh, what, are they using these resources to uh, track down pedophiles or potential rapists or terrorists? No, <laughs> no they're not doing that. They're, they're using it because they've got this immense black budget and they've got to spend it on something. When I, was, when I first started teaching, my first teaching gig was as a tutor at El Camino Community College in uh, Torrance. And uh, I went in to see my counselor and the counselor said, I see you get good grades in English. Would you, would you like to be a tutor? I said, sure. How much are you going to pay me? This is how much we'll pay you. Show up on Monday at 3 o'clock. I show up at Monday at 3 o'clock. I sit in the room right, with these two math tutors. There's no one there. No one ever came in. I think maybe two times during the entire semester did anyone actually come in to get tutored. So I was sitting there collecting a paycheck and doing like my homework is what I was doing. And at one point I asked the, the math tutors who had been there many months before me, I said, what, what are we supposed to do? And they just laughed. And they said, oh, you know, you don't understand. They, they get a certain amount of money from the government, and they need to spend it. If they don't spend it, then they'll give them less next time. So that's why we're here. Jeez. Oh, <laughs> uh, so, so this is – now imagine that situation exaggerated a thousand times into the black budget, and that's the situation you have here with all these the surveillance going on. They're, they're following Damien because they need to do something, and so why not follow him? And, and so they, they were – uh, I think using him also as a guinea pig uh, because he he um, began to notice, he began to sense that there were people in the house with him that he couldn't see. Now, at first that sounds crazy, uh, but there was one day where he was in the bathroom and he was opening the medicine cabinet, the mirrored medicine cabinet in the bathroom, mm-hmm. and as he turned the mirror, he could see the people behind him. As the mirror was in motion, they became visible. Now, again, that sounds crazy, except that later on, through total synchronicity and coincidence, uh, Damien contacts me. He was looking on the Internet, trying to find, um, in, in between all of this, Damien had since fled San Diego, and there's a whole sort of epic story in the middle there, but I'm flashing forward. Uh, Damien was looking on the Internet, trying to find anything that looked like this technology that he had seen, these invisible people. Uh, and, he, and, and there was some guy, some inventor in Japan who had invented a cloak that was an invisibility cloak. He'd gotten written up in newspapers and stuff, but that didn't look like what he had seen. He finally came across this website from this guy named Richard Schoengert, who's a scientist who lives here in Southern California, who developed something called Project Camellio. And he, uh, Schoengert has an actual top secret uh, clearance, um, but this was a private project that he was doing himself. Damien looks at it and he, and he said, this is what I saw. This, this type of technology is what I saw. So, so I look it up and to my amazement, it says that Richard Schoenger, the scientist, is a 32nd degree Freemason with the Scottish Rite Long Beach, Scottish Rite Lodge, which I'm also a member of. <laughs> so I suddenly realized that I knew this guy. I must have met him at some point, but didn't remember meeting him. Uh, and so I contacted him through email, and I said, I understand that you've developed this technology, and, you, and uh, I'd like to interview you. And he writes back, and, he, and I told him I'm also a 32nd degree Freemason. You know, he, he's a 33rd degree Freemason. And I said, I'm a 32nd degree Freemason in the Long Beach Scottish Rite, just like you, and I'd like to interview you. I, I'm a writer. And he says, sure. And I said, I got this friend. He'd like to meet you too. He said, okay, bring him along. So, so me and Damien take Richard Schoenger out to lunch. And then we, I took him back to campus, and we interviewed him for two hours. Well, he tells us this incredible story about this technology he developed, and, and everything he said matched with what Damien experienced. 
Uh, and then about an hour into the interview, I told Damien, you tell him what you experienced. So Damien tells him the whole story about, about San Diego and, and about the, the night vision goggles and the NCIS hassling him and, the, and what he saw. And at first, Sean Gert was just sort of not reacting to it all. And then when Damien mentioned the thing about the mirror and how they saw him in the mirror, and he also mentioned how sometimes they would appear to be sort of these like aura-like um, dots in the air. And if, apparently, if the technology is not working quite right, it looks like this kind of like these dots, like uh, auras, like you see when um, if you have a serious migraine headache, mm -hmm. that, that type of thing. And when he when he mentioned that detail, Schoenger just sort of like leaned forward and he said, "That's exactly what it looks like when it's not working." Mm. Uh, and and then Schoenger had mentioned before I even had Damien tell him the story that ten years prior. To this interview, uh, the NCIS, I mean, rather the Navy, uh, had approached him, was interested in his technology, and Schoenger thought, oh, they're going to help fund this, because uh, uh, it, it would require a lot of money to actually you know, actualize this in reality. Uh, and uh, they basically you know, talked to him for a long time, sucked up all this information out of his brain, <laughs> and then went away. And uh, Schoenger, even before Damien tells him the story, Schoenger said, I've always wondered if they you know, were just interested in picking my brain. Uh, well, uh, one of the corporations that he spoke to was S SAIC, uh, which is a defense uh, corporation in, in San Diego. In fact, they're based uh, about a mile, within a mile where Damien was living at the time. And, and uh, they had also uh, spoke to Richard. So uh, uh, this sort of uh, bizarre harassment of using uh, people as guinea pigs, they often pick people who are drug addicts, uh, homeless, uh, maybe they're already uh, crazy. That way, if they start talking about this, no one will believe them. Yeah. So sometimes uh, that homeless guy freaking out on the street, they're watching me, might be telling the truth. <laughs> absolutely 21st absolutely. century paranoia huh well we we don't know how he ended up there i mean i mean in san diego it was a story just the other day i have a blog cryptoscatology.com and I, I i posted about this there was a guy in san diego who climbed up to the top of the fbi building and wanted to see an fbi agent because he said he was afraid of the police when i saw that i immediately knew what was going on and what was happening to him because uh, san diego is a military town and there's a lot of people beyond damien who are being experimented on. Um, and uh, in this case, in Damien's case, it just so happened that he had a friend who was, A, wrote about conspiracies, B, a Scottish Rite Freemason, uh, <laughs> C, a college teacher. And so I knew I had experience and knew what he was talking about. I knew he wasn't crazy. Most of the time, this kind of thing alienates the person from everyone around them because they immediately think they've gone nuts. Uh, and, they, and, and they will purposely... Um, do this gang stalking stuff in such a way where the friends and the neighbors, they don't know anything about it. They can do it right in front of your face and you don't know anything about it because they're just following that one person and they're harassing that one particular person. <sighs> and, and in fact, these techniques go way back, apparently. They go back to the Ku Klux Klan. The Klan would use these techniques, not, not the invisibility technology, but the, the, the gang stalking harassment uh, aspect of it. They would use that to, to get black people out of their neighborhoods after the Civil War. Well, there was CIA involvement in KKK, too, so. Well, that's true. Well, yeah, that, that's true. They, 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 quote, infiltrate them. <laughs> so what do you think 21st century paranoia is going to be like if you bring in virtual reality and nanotechnology Transhumanism. Well, they're already doing it. I mean, in, in Damien's case, they were projecting hallucinations into his house. Uh, one night, they projected a shadow on the wall holding a gun, and the shadow was pointing the gun at his head. Uh, sometimes Damien would open the door, and they would project holograms outside, so it looked like this alien world was outside, outside the window. Yeah. Uh, people came over to his house and asked him if his apartment was getting larger because they were able to use this technology, this Project Camellio technology, to make it seem as if the inside of his house was getting bigger, like the TARDIS and Doctor Who. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, when we asked Richard about this, Schoenger confirmed that, yes, you could use this technology, this, this Camellio technology, to make it look like uh, a room that's small is actually bigger than it is. And the whole point of that is just to drive someone crazy. And so 
Uh, everything. It, what's paranoia going to look like? It's going to look like anything that you could possibly imagine. Oh, <laughs> yeah, you have to have a strong mind. You have to be a holistic person to be grounded, you know? Well, part of the reason I, I published the article in Fortean Times, and of course some of the feedback I got was obviously this guy is crazy. Uh, um, me and uh, Damien, I guess, is what they were implying. Um, uh, but the fact is uh, that as, uh, as long as the story gets out, and more people are aware of it. At this point, no one knows what the hell gang stalking is. They never heard. You didn't even hear about it. No. Uh, I got contacted by a production company who's trying to do a documentary about this uh, for one of the, the networks, uh, the Discovery Channel. And they're actually going out and interviewing people who are being gang stalked. Uh, there's more people than just Damien that it's happening to. Uh, and uh, as more information gets out about it, at, at the very least, even if they even if they write about it in a way that makes it seem like it's all crazy, at least the people that it's happening to will be able to see it and identify what's happening to them. Because what's so frightening about it is that they think that they are going crazy because uh, they've never heard of this before. They've never heard of, of this happening to anyone. Uh, and so if, if you're, as H.P. Lovecraft said, the most primal fear is, is fear of the unknown, uh, uh, the fact that it's unknown, you don't know what's happening to you, you think you might be going crazy, and yet you, you know you're not, um, everyone around you saying that that's not possible, maybe you need to go see a psychiatrist. If the information gets out, even through a magazine like 40 and Times, which, which mainly deals with sort of paranormal phenomena, uh, as the more information that gets out about it, the, the less likely people will be uh, completely scared or, or think that they're going crazy. Because the, the most important thing is for them to realize that they're not going crazy. Now, from your research, what was the earliest mention of conspiracy theory in media? I know you talk about some more recent 2004, but Rich Cohen's article in Vanity Fair, Welcome to the Conspiracy. Right. Uh, well, I mean, I suppose in terms of the actual phrase conspiracy theory, that, that, that's a, a, a good question because I'm not entirely certain when the phrase conspiracy theory became a, der uh, a derogatory term. Uh, when it became a pejorative. Because, of course, we all know, if you ask any judge or police officer, people are convicted of conspiracy every single day in the United States and the U.S. Yeah. Uh, justice system. Yeah. you know, And yet people talk about it as if it's this mythological beast like a unicorn <laughs> or something. Oh, you're talking about conspiracies? Ha! It, it, what, are you, what are you talking about? You People are convicted of conspiracies all the time. Yeah. Uh, all it means is there's two or more people doing something against someone else. Uh, uh, and so I don't know how it became. Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good trick, isn't it? To mm -hmm. get something <laughs> that's part of the U.S. justice system and get it so that everyone reacts to it as if, it's, uh, it's, it's, you, as if you're talking about you know, gnomes or, or goblins <laughs> or something. Uh, I, I, I don't know how, quite how they did that. <laughs> well, explain why you brought up mythology, and I know you compare the field of conspiracy theory to classical mythology. Explain what you mean. Uh, well, it is uh, it, it is mythological uh, in the sense that uh, I, I mentioned in the introduction that myth is something that can be uh, true. Uh, I mean, in, in other words, uh, there are myths that are based on reality, and then there are uh, historical events that turn into myths later on. So myths are a mixture of truth and untruth. Uh, and the same is true with conspiracy theory. Uh, it, it's often a mixture of truth and untruth, um, uh, sometimes on purpose, sometimes on accident. Uh, and by that I mean we're all familiar with the old telephone game where you take a sentence and tell someone and then have them repeat it and by the time you get to the end of the line the sentence is, is completely changed um, that would be sort of the benign uh, misinformation aspect of conspiracy theory I in the introduction I divide conspiracies into five different categories which are insanity disinformation misinformation satire and legitimate research uh, and so the distinction between disinformation and misinformation is Disinformation is an act of lie. It's something that has been purposely um, injected uh, into the story in order to completely discredit it. 
uh, misinformation is where the researcher is is sincere, but he's he's passing on uh, information that's wrong, but it's not necessarily a lie. And so, in myths, you have a mixture of truth and untruth, and conspiracy theory, uh, particularly under that category of misinformation and, and disinformation, you also have a mixture of truth and, and untruth. The more serious or somber conspiracy theories that we mentioned earlier who sort of lack a sense of humor, uh, they, they get very incensed. Um, uh, for example, they would be annoyed by my book because I, I mix uh, stuff in there that seems to be maybe absurd. Uh, uh, with stuff that is actually legitimate, and they think that that somehow uh, discredits everything else. But my attitude was, you know, the subtitle is conspiracy theory is art form. I could have written a sort of dry academic thesis about how conspiracy theory has become an art form, but instead I just decided to demonstrate it with the book itself. So the book itself is is an art object, uh, and I decided to approach the subject matter by saying here are these five categories, you know, in the in the introduction in the ch in first in chapter one, and then going on from there to actually showing uh, these various categories of uh, insanity. I mentioned the uh, Stephen King uh, shot John Lennon uh, theory uh, of a fellow named Stephen Lightfoot, who I met in the streets of Monterey, California, who drives around in a van uh, and insists that um, John Lennon was shot by Stephen King. Um, and I, I think that we can all probably agree that that's insane. <laughs> um, and um, and I'm sure Stephen King is well aware of this gentleman. Uh, and, and number uh, disinformation, I use the example of the uh, UFO cover up live from 1988, which was a, a documentary that that uh, insisted that um, uh, the gray aliens very much like to eat strawberry ice cream. Um, which is the detail that most people seem to remember from that documentary, even though there was actually some very legitimate good information in that documentary as well. It was hosted by Mike Farrell. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, three, the misinformation I use as an example, uh, NASA Mooned America, the book by uh, Ralph Rene, which is all about uh, that we never went to the moon, which, which I think is definitely misinformation. But however, in that book, uh, Rene has very good information about the deaths of... Uh, uh, Virgil um, Grissom and uh, Roger Chafee and Ed White, uh, who died in the Apollo spacecraft in 1967, under very mysterious circumstances. So in that particular book, as I say, you know, myth, it's a mixture of truth and untruth. In that book, you have the, the untruth, what I perceive to be the untruth of, 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 the, of the idea that we never went to the moon, and, and mixed in with very valid information about NASA uh, faking photographs, uh, which I think Ralph Renee demonstrates, uh, and the, the mysterious assassinations of these three astronauts. Um, so, a mixture of truth and untruth. Uh, also, uh, category four, uh, satire. Uh, that's a, that's a category most people do not think of when they think of conspiracy theories of it being satirical. But some people do use it for that purpose. And the earliest example I use of that is the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which uh, was originally a satire called Dialogue in Hell, published in 1865, and it was plagiarized in 1905 and turned into this anti-Semitic tract, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which the Nazis later used and republished uh, as evidence that there was this Jewish conspiracy. But it started out as satire and then was and then people without a sense of humor, meaning the Nazis. Well, uh, and you don't need the protocols of Zion to know that there's a Zionist conspiracy. Just look up the people who are in various positions of power in America, for instance. Oh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, the, absolutely. Uh, uh, but uh, in, that, in that case, uh, what's interesting about that case is that it began as fiction. Uh, and then later on, someone decided to say it was not fiction. Um, uh, and uh, and then the, there's the Leonard Lewin's Report on Iron Mountain, which is an interesting book because uh, it too is satirical, or rather Leonard Lewin claimed it was satirical, basically in that it, it, it purports to be an actual government document that says that um, um, the government was using fake um, stories about aliens uh, in, in order to, as sort of psychological warfare. And 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 uh, what's interesting about that case is that Report on Iron Mountain, again, according to Leonard Lewin, who wrote it, was was all fiction. He said it was satirical. But later on, L. Fletcher Prouty, 
who was Mr. X in the G Oliver Stone and JFK film, uh, he was the, the contact for, for Jim Garrison and gave him a lot of information when Garrison was investigating the assassination of JFK. El Fletcher Prouty said that when he read the report on Iron Mountain when it first came out in the, in the 60s, he said, oh, you know, I was the advisor to JFK. I heard all these guys talking. This is what they were saying. You know, all the stuff that was in this book is what they were saying. So in that case, Lewin wrote fiction that sort of accidentally turned out to be true. Mm. Um, and then the, the fifth category, uh, which is just simply legitimate research, and that would be, and, there, and there's numerous examples of that, um, John Rappaport being a preeminent example of, of AIDS, Inc., and, and all of his books. Um, and, uh, you know, the whole notion of, of AIDS being a biowarfare weapon is, is, I think, well documented in, in Rappaport's book and also uh, Emerging Viruses by Linda Horowitz and um, AIDS and the Doctors of Death by Alan Cantwell. Um, that, that, that's a conspiracy theory, which I think we, we can just remove the word theory from it. Um, I, I think it's pretty, the paper trail on that is pretty clear, really. Uh, and uh, in terms of uh, UFOs, uh, which you can't really talk about conspiracies without talking about UFOs, mm -hmm. there are a lot of legitimate UFO researchers, um, uh, Timothy Goods, Above Top Secret, and um, uh, Randy Copang has a book called Camouflage as Limited Disclosure, which you should have Randy Copang on the show. I uh, I, I know him, okay. and uh, he, he he gives excellent interviews. All you have to do is just uh, uh, point the remote control at him and, and hit the play button, and then he, <laughs> and he goes. <laughs> uh, uh, and and you know, uh, Secret Societies, uh, America's Secret Establishment by Anthony Sutton is is an excellent book, which I, I quote in my article, The War Against the Imagination. Um, these things that that people talk about as being uh, paranoia. Um, yeah, you know, there are, there are those guys who are on the street corner raving because they're genuinely schizophrenic. Uh, and then there are those people who are raving because they've been driven mad by gang stalking yeah. <laughs> operations. So the, the, the myth part is how do you tell the difference between the two? Well, you have to be very discerning. You have to, when you go into the Chapel Perilous, you have to have the wand of intuition and the wand of rationality. Mm -hmm. If you have both of those and if, and if you're balanced, then maybe you'll be able to wind your way through this uh, labyrinth of myths and get out on the other side with your sanity intact. I agree. Well, I had so many more things I wanted to ask you, but I have one more question for you. Your associate in Seattle sent numerous examples of how high school exams have been embedded with neuro-linguistic programming techniques. Can you tell us about this? Well, that's very, uh, that's very basic in the sense of um, when, when we say neuro-linguistic programming techniques, uh, simply um, just the act of a Scantron is, is, is an act of neuro-linguistic programming uh, techniques. I call Scantron Scamtrons uh, with an M instead of an N because basically what is the purpose of it? It limits the possibilities. And that's the whole war against the imagination. Let's limit the possibilities, clamp down on what we think is possible. There's only, it's the Hegelian dialectic, right? There's only, there's only two ways of doing this, okay? Either A or B. And if you're trapped in A or B and you think there's no other way, you're going to be trapped your whole life. You have to step out and say, oh, no, it's not just A, B, C, or D. Uh, there's another possibility. There's another way. Uh, and there's always another way. Uh, but but uh, scantrons, uh, they they train your brain to think that there's only a limited amount of possibilities, and that that I mean that's just classic negative like NLP programming. A friend of mine in high school would take Vaseline and and he'd smear it on the side of the scantron where the laser reads the thing, and so the 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 Vaseline would create like this mirror like effect, and the laser would bounce off it, and so it would correct it would make it mark everything as correct. Uh, <laughs> And, and uh, but uh, I recommend if you do that to to uh, don't put the Vaseline on every single single thing because it'll be 100 percent. It might look suspicious. That's funny. Thanks, Robert. Can you give out your website and let people know where people can get your book? Uh, it's uh, cryptoscatology.com. C r y p t o s c a t o l o g y. Purposely pick something that you could remember easily. Cryptoscatology.com. And uh, if you, you can order my book, Cryptoscatology, through Amazon or through Trine Day, uh, which is the publisher of the book. Cool. Thank you so much, Robert. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, it, it's been fun over here as well. Hopefully we won't have another earthquake uh, very soon. 
And if you want a signed copy of Robert's book, Cryptoscatology, you can purchase that from Cryptoscatology.com, which is Robert's website. And I forgot to mention during the interview, for those of you who really want to know what the Illuminati source documents actually say, listen to the interview with Jiva Singha Anand and Joseph Wages on Red Ice Radio as they translated the rituals and doctrines of the Bavarian Order of the Illuminati. They have been called apologists for the Illuminati, but are, however, among the few who have actually translated the ritual and doctrine of the real Bavarian Illuminati. So there are things we can know for sure. I hear a lot of guys these days who at one time were interested in conspiracy theory, but something went on with them and now they spend an awful lot of time trying to debunk everything. Don't be one of those bitter guys, but don't be one of those guys or gals who believes everything right away either. The truth might be somewhere in between, but that is something you have to discover for yourself. Remember, you can find me and also Radio 314 on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+. If you like what we do, you can support us by signing up for a membership at RedIceMembers.com. Look out because some great interviews are coming up. We'll talk soon. <laughs>